Good morning. It's uh, nice to welcome you this morning. Just one uh, notice as reminder this morning that uh, we have midweek communion on Tuesday at two o'clock. So everybody would uh, be welcome uh, as we celebrate communion on uh, Tuesday at two o'clock. So let's just pray for a moment. Dear Lord, quieten our hearts, still our minds, as we come to worship you. We thank you for all that you give and praise you for all that you are. In Jesus' name, amen. And uh, it's a great delight to welcome Steve Singleton to lead our worship this morning. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see some familiar faces. So you must, uh, just from where I'm looking, you look, you look like a lot of must ban bandits. Um, can I uh, welcome on your behalf those who might be sharing in the service uh, through Zoom and also those who might be following the service on the internet. It's um, very interesting. I told my grandchildren I would be on TV and the, they were most impressed. So we'll be waiting for the criticism afterwards. We're going to begin our worship by singing together the hymn 351, In Christ Alone.
I'm going to come a bit closer so at least I can see the whites of your eyes. <laughs> I remember I was a minister in South Africa and one of my stewards had a false eye. The trouble was I never remembered which one it was. <laughs> and sometime he seemed to be looking off at two different angles. Um, but eye contact is so important uh, because that's how we feel like we're connecting with people, isn't it? It's nice to see some uh, familiar faces and to be with you. We've been in a very difficult uh, phase of life, haven't we? Um, it's almost as if we've been treading water, don't you think, uh, for such a long time? And in a sense, the period um, after Easter, after Good Friday, through to Pentecost is 50 days where everything appears almost flat, don't you think? Um, empty. Um, and um, that's perhaps almost reminiscent of where we've been becalmed for two years and struggling to make oh, our way through the doldrums um, and to find a new sense of being. Um, so just we're, as we gather, we're going to just come to God in that space. Let's pray. Gracious, loving God, we thank you that you call us together. We thank you that we're your people, that we belong to you and to each other. We pray for the people who are connected to us by Zoom and by the internet. We're thankful for the way in which Zoom has proved to be such an important tool in the past two years for us maintaining contacts with people, keeping in touch with them. We pray that as we gather today, that you will meet us in the moments that we feel perhaps empty or flat, that you will restore our confidence if we've lost it, that you will renew our faith if it's flagging, that you will fill us again with the joy of the Easter message, that our hearts might be stirred, that we might be awakened from this trance-like experience that we've been in. Lord, the world hasn't gone away. And even now, the things happening in Ukraine confront us, challenge us, leave us sorrowful and desperate, thinking about how human beings can be so cruel, cruel and how people can be so ruthless. So even now, as we come to you, we come perhaps many of us with a real concern for the outcome of the next day or two and what Vladimir Putin might say or do next. So we don't pretend, Lord, to come naively with uh, a sense of, of optimism, but we come trusting you, looking to you, to help us to find meaning, looking to you to find us, help us find hope, looking to you to find solutions to the problems that life poses. So draw close to us. Help us if we've come with a heavy heart and a heavy burden to set it down before you. Minister to us, Lord, in this time together, in the quietness. And help us know that your nearness is something we can lean upon and trust in a changing world. A world where we have a little control. And as we find both healing and forgiveness, a new joy, then give us 
both the strength and the will to work for a new world that's characterized by justice and by searching for peace and equality. So we gather the prayers of our hearts, the longings, the concerns on our minds. We gather them together, Lord, as we share in the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now we're going to have our first reading. The reading is taken. The reading is taken. Um, from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 11. The resurrection of Christ. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved. If you hold firmly to the word I have preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter, and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, many of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. And last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Thanks be to God. Thank you. Our next... Um, Two hymns are hymns that you may not be familiar with, um, but you'll notice I usually have a twinkle in my eye as I inflict these unknown hymns on my congregations. Um, but um, Nicholas had a look at them, and she's going to uh, play the tunes uh, through at least one verse to give us an idea how they go, and then we will uh, take a leap of faith uh, and sing on the day of resurrection.
Did many of you know that hymn? I, I didn't know it, but um, I loved it. I hope you did. Now we're going to have our gospel passage. The Gospel is taken from Luke chapter 24, verses 36 to 49. Jesus appears to the disciples. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled? And why did doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still didn't believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything to here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Thanks be to God. Thank you, thank you. We sing together our next hymn, Crashing Waters at Creation.
Well, the first one was better than the second one. <laughs> Extra verse. Oh, it's all right. We did very well. And as I said, you don't learn anything um, really new without making some mistakes, do you? <laughs> um, about 50 years ago, uh, long before many of you were born, of course, <laughs> um, I uh, finished an apprentice, apprenticeship at um, Sellafield. You'll recall Sellafield, notorious. In fact, the reason I glow is I'm still radioactive. <laughs> Um, and from, so from the Lake District, where I grew up, um, the lush green fields, I want you just to imagine for a moment, the, for those of you who've been there, the uh, beautiful lakes, places like Grasmere and Rydal Water, perfect reflections, Tarnhouse, um, the little um, dry stone walls, demarking every uh, field, um, the sheep, everywhere you looked, and of course the endless rain. <laughs> sea toller is supposed to get the most rain in the UK, usually all at once. Um, and when I was 20, um, I sort of somehow volunteered to do voluntary work in Africa. And um, a week after finishing my apprenticeship, I was on a plane to German Southwest Africa, which I'd never heard of. And uh, of course it's become Namibia. Um, and I got off the plane and there was no, nothing in sight. Literally the, the air, airfield was half an hour from Vintuk, and it was just bush. There wasn't a dry stone wall in sight. There wasn't a fence anywhere. It was just brown and empty and barren. Um, you can imagine the, the sort of culture shock to go from um, the Lake District with its um, miniature beauty to a place where um, you know you could just see for miles and there wasn't a house and there wasn't a fence and that was half an hour to get to the town. Um, I worked for the Anglican church for that year I was there and the bishop said would I go and pick his children up at school the first week and I said, that's fine. Um, and he said, the trouble is they're in Cape Town. It's a thousand mile drive. <laughs> and I'm not kidding you. The road from Vintook to Cape Town is as straight as this aisle. Um, so you can imagine the sort of, um, almost the sense of emptiness. Um, sheer sort of just no fences, no, nothing. Um, and it, you'd think it actually uh, was not beautiful at all until I'd been there just a, a little while and I realized that it had a hidden beauty. Um, the sunsets in Namibia are just phenomenal. It's because, of course, the sun shines through all the rising dust. And um, so the sunsets are out of this world. Um, in our country, most of the time it's overcast, isn't it? You don't see a real clear sky. When you look up to the African sky, you see a myriad of stars. You see stars everywhere and it's something that just leaves you gawping it's just amazing there's a strange beauty 
And it didn't rain for the first six weeks, but I smelt it when it was coming. I've never smelt the rain here. Well, not really. I don't tend to bother with smelling it. Um, but I could smell it coming. And when you see a flower on a solitary cactus in the middle of nothing, it assumes an incredible beauty just because of that burst of color in the midst of the hostile environment. It's got the biggest sand dunes in the world, Namibia, and they're amazing. And the second week I was there, the bishop asked me if I'd like to drive to, to the coast, which is 500 miles, to uh, accompany him on a confirmation tour 50 years ago. But what it struck me was that sort of sense of activity uh, filled busy lives with the contrast, the sharp contrast with the days immediately after Good Friday. The disciples were quite frantically busy, weren't they? With that, the 50 days beforehand, there was people always clamoring for Jesus' attention. He was ministering, he was teaching, he was healing. People were um, wanting his attention. There wasn't much space for himself. It's a small country, and as they journeyed to Jerusalem, there was a sense in which everywhere there was very little space, although we recall the, the, the desert wandering that he went through um, that was, to all intents and purposes, an empty space, but full of meaning. And so what happens is that there's this sort of sharp contrast, the frenetic activity followed by total inactivity. Um, and, and it seems to me that that reflects something of what we've been through in the past two years. Um, I was very blessed because um, my seventh grandchild, grandson was born uh, at the beginning of the first lockdown, Barney, his name is, um, and he adores his granddad. Who wouldn't? <laughs> he, my wife could learn a few lessons from my grandson. Um, but, you know, by and large, like most of you, we were confined to barracks. We were then, in a sense, you're struggling to come to terms with lots of things that are going on under the surface. They're not visible, but they're in the space there, aren't they? And so it was, if you like, a whole lot of emotional things going on. Um, if we think that that space was empty after Easter, we'd be wrong. They were on a, an emotional roller coaster. Um, so, for instance, they go from the height of Palm Sunday and the euphoria surrounding Jesus entering Jerusalem, all their hopes about to be fulfilled as they see or uh, believe that the Romans will be overturned and, and routed by this king in the order of David. So they're full of hosannas and waving of palms, and then there's this tension as Jesus overturns the money changes tables. There's this Ill, -e Ill at ease feeling. There's this confusion as to what happens next. The sense of anxiety and fear, personal fear. For Peter, there will be a sense of regrets and his feeling of betrayal of his master. And then the horrific events of that Friday that leave them traumatized. 
and struggling to come to terms with the dashing of all their dreams. There's so much going on, isn't there? Under the surface. And that's true for us and it has been as we've been journeying through that pandemic, not least fears, um, worries for family and concerns about the impact of this uh, illness disease. And um, of course, it's, it's easy to forget, it's taken over 6 million lives. Um, it's, and it's still, its impact is still being felt in many families, isn't it? Um, so they, uh, in a, if you like, they're going through a whole lot of immersion, emotional turmoil. And that makes this whole story of East all the more incredible. If you were to, for a moment, pause and look at the uh, accounts of Jesus' appearances, one of the most interesting ones is where he appears to Thomas, Thomas the Doubter. Thomas is so emphatic about his not believing because he has been traumatized. He's witnessed the wounds being inflicted on Jesus. He's so traumatized by that that he can't believe that these rumors have any grounds for belief. Unless I see the wounds, unless I touch them, I will not believe. It's all very well what the women might say, but I saw him die. So, you know, you've got the pain of that, of that parting, that grief, and then what seemed to be just hallucinations. And they do seem like that because there's an element of mystery about them all. They seem ethereal. They seem almost to differ, disappear like mist in the morning. And they can't tie him down when he does appear. They can't hold him. And so that there's this sort of uncertainty there anxious about the, the government, the state, arresting them as well. They're in twos and threes, hidden away, numb. In many respects, of course, we pick up some of our own experiences when we're going through bereavement, don't we? In that story, our own range of emotions, that change. So it's not an empty space. The title of the address was The Spaces in Between. And that's what I'm trying to get at, really, that the emptiness is an illusion, actually, because the empty space is full of things. And then it's full of, of questions. Quite understandably, You've got these disciples that we sang about going to Emmaus, and they are pondering these things. It's, they're turning it round, and, and they're trying to find some meaning in it. Often one of the things that we find when we lose somebody is we're often wrestling to find meaning. It must have been, you know, God must have wanted them. Um, there must be a greater purpose in this. Accepting that, that there's no meaning is actually quite hard. So they're asking questions. And as they walk to Emmaus, these seven miles, the stranger draws alongside and unfolds the clues in the scriptures to his destiny, his purpose. Their expectations had been entirely limited to the overthrow of the occupying power. 
stranger begins to show them that this has far reaching consequences. And so they're left asking the question, who is this man? When you ask that, who is this guy? Who is this guy? What does this mean? You know, aren't those the questions we will be asking? Once those little bits of evidence piled up, you'd be struggling not to say, what does this mean? And so that empty space is full of questions, searching for answers, looking for meaning. And again, that's where we find ourselves. In a bereavement, we're looking for meaning. We want, we want answers. This is so important because many people dismiss Easter as just a Christian festival. Um, Paul really actually, in that second reading, thanks for reading it, by the way. Um, you know, Paul is the one who actually goes away after his own encounter with the risen Lord and seeks to unpack and spell out what these things mean. And he's away for some years. And interestingly, his, his blindness, which for me is very much a metaphor for spiritual blindness, gives way to the scales falling away, him seeing, him seeing, perceiving, and finding a truth that is far more than just a man dying on a cross. There are many artists who've actually depicted the crucifixion over the years. Um, I remember seeing one, a Flemish artist, I can't recall his name, but it was almost, there was a, a yellow tinge to it, which made Jesus look quite jaundiced, I thought. And, and there was a sort of a pastoral element to it that almost felt to me to be quite bland. There were sheep in the background and and, it, and, and then I've seen other sort of artist representations. One where there was a grotesque Christ got on a cross, anger and hate in his face, um, almost being electrified. Um, a gesture, if you like, of rebellion against injustice. But the one that strikes me and st stays with me is Salvador Dali's image. Christ of St. John of the Cross. And in that, Christ hangs between heaven and earth as if he is pulling or holding together heaven and earth. And for me, the artist has managed to capture something profound about the purpose of the death and resurrection of Jesus. That it's not just about a man long ago dying on a cross that we might feel pity for or admiration for. What he does on the cross somehow changes the landscape forever. It's a cosmic shift. And for me, Salvador Dali manages to capture that What am I trying to say is the artists are actually interpreting events, aren't they? Um, and each of us are invited to interpret who this man is. Is he just a man we admire because he lived a good life? He was a kind man. Is he a man who um, God used? Um, and showed us a different way to live, to absorb pain and, and transform it by love? Or is he, as Paul writes, is it God in Christ 
reconciling the world unto himself. And in, in this, of course, we've got one eye on the cross and we've got one eye on Pentecost. We're, we're, we're looking at, in a sense, at who Jesus is, but then Pentecost, the promise of the Spirit coming, is Christ with us and will be in us to empower us to live this life. And that's, we tried to sing that second hymn, that third hymn pretty well, didn't we? All about crashing waters. You thought, I bet you thought, what's this got to do with all this? Of course, it's about the idea of out of nothing, out of nothing comes order and life because of the spirit at the very beginning. And that we are invited to realize that the waiting is not an empty space, but a preparation, a pregnant pause as we prepare ourselves to be equipped and empowered to live this life that we are called to. So the bottom line in all of this is what do you make of that Easter event? And perhaps the other side of that coin is what will you let make, or what will you let Christ make of you? Because it's not just what we think of him that counts. It's whether we allow him to work in us and through us. So that his risen life is set free in us. So let's come back full circle to the pandemic. It may appear to you that the space, the last two years are wasted years. They're not. You've probably learned a lot more than you realize. If not about yourself, and about the importance of family. Yeah. Also the importance of the Christian community to you. If you've learned nothing else, you've learned that we need sometimes to stop and pause and reflect on things of eternal significance, things that matter. And that sometimes Places like the garden become places where we find God and where we find peace and a sense of balance and perspective and rhythm. It's not empty space, it's full. So as we journey to Pentecost through this flat land, may we find that we, for a moment, glimpse the risen Lord. And having glimpsed him, are amazed and changed. Amen. I'm just going to spend a moment in prayer. Let's, let's pray. Gracious God, we bring you our lives and we bring you our offering today. Sometimes we feel that we have little to offer. Sometimes we feel empty and we bring that emptiness and offer it to you. Sometimes we feel hurt or angry. So we bring those mixed emotions too. 
Sometimes we feel helpless and out of control. And so we come seeking to surrender our lives to your control. We bring our gifts of money, our time, and pray that you will bless us, the giver, and our gifts. Both those we put some value on and those that appear to be valueless. Realizing that sometimes those are the most important gifts. So bless them, for we ask it in your name. Amen. You, like me, may feel um, that uh, there's been a bit of a countdown till uh, May, the May parade in, in Russia. And um, that, in a sense, many of us are on tenter hooks, knowing what the president of Russia is, is going to do next. So the next hymn we're going to sing is about, um, if you like, our concern for world order for peace, for justice. So we sing together, we turn to you, O oh God.
Please be seated. We come seeking our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, humble us before you. We come with heavy hearts, Lord. We've been watching the news for the past month or so, maybe two months, and hearing the news from Ukraine as countless people have been bombarded with missiles and bombs. And we grieve for the loss of life through the ruthlessness and ambition of, of one man. Lord, we pray that this conflict will end, that it will end with a ceasing of violence and a recognition of each other's right to survive and enjoy freedom. We pray for the people of Ukraine absorbing all that bombardment. We pray for the families of soldiers, both Russian and Ukrainian. We pray for the innocents caught in the melee, children, elderly. And Lord, we grieve over the failure to learn the lessons of the past. We think too of Afghanistan, where it's almost as if they've gone back 30 years. We pray, Lord, that the faith of those people might lead them to mutual respect, particularly of women in their culture particularly also of people of other faiths and beliefs. Lord, we grieve that so often belief in you in some form or other becomes an extremism that leads to hate and hurt. Lord, we pray that you will work in these situations to bring peace and justice. And so as we come to the May Day Parade tomorrow, we pray that it might not be for Putin an opportunity to increase the violence but an opportunity for him to step back. Lord, we pray for each other, for family members, friends, for those who are in need of our prayers, laid aside in sickness, struggling with issues. Lord, we pray for those people still suffering from COVID and its attendant effects, those who've lost loved ones, those who are hurting and angry. Lord, fill the spaces in between with your love, with grace, with good humor. So may we face the future with whatever it holds, with a, a deep trust in you and a deep confidence in you. Equip us with your spirit, Lord. Pour out your spirit and bring order out of chaos. And in our own lives, in our families, if, we've, if we're worried about things, Lord, just alleviate those worries. If it's about our own health, give us a deep sense of peace. If it's about the well-being of others in our families. 
Again, help us to entrust them to your care. So we surrender our lives to you, our world to you, your world, Lord, praying that your kingdom might come where people respect each other, where people honor their loved ones, their families, and others of different views. So bless us as we go our separate ways. Be our rock and our redeemer. Be our saviour and our Lord. Help us to discover the full meaning of Easter. We ask these our prayers in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's been nice, good to be with you. Um, and our thanks to Nicola for um, managing our music for us. Thank you. And um, our sound person who... <laughs> sorry. sorry. <laughs> um, for making sure he didn't switch me off. Um, our closing hymn is Jesus, the name, high over all.
Now, normally, I'd ask you to hold hands with each other, uh, but given the circumstances and your concern about catching something, <laughs> you better not do that, really, had you? But I wonder if you might look around. I remember when I was a boy, um, going to a uh, school assembly at the end of the day, I think I was probably about eight or nine, and um, we used to put the chairs on the tables and we'd say the blessing. And I remember saying to the teacher, Miss, he had his eyes open during the prayer. It took me a while to realize, of course, that I'd given the game away. <laughs> but please keep your eyes open and greet one another with the blessing. We say together, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God bless everyone.